So I gave elements of this paper back in the, the Roman archaeology, uh, theoretical archaeology group uh, conference. And so I've adapted it a bit so that I'm not saying the same, entirely the same stuff again. So I'm going to start off by really just paraphrasing some of the stuff that Richard has mentioned. Because when I presented this for the first time last year, I was kind of a bit blown away when I went into the, the, the Roman conference and said, so, you know, we've heard all of these ideas, all of these different theoretical concepts, and, you know, who's heard of elemental theory? And I just got crickets, like nothing. It was just tumbleweed. No one had heard of it. And that kind of blew my mind, because when you engage with classicists or uh, indeed with medieval historians, it's all over the place, in particular within uh, medical literature as well. So what I'm going to do in this one is just think how... This kind of elemental wheel and the things that Richard have said give us the opportunity to have sort of different perspectives and therefore perhaps different interpretations on some of the, the data with the, that we have in the archaeological record and potentially then to find new answers to some old questions. OK, so again, paraphrasing what Richard said, if we accept then that this kind of elemental humoral wheel sees that everything and the more I look into this, the more I do see that this is something that sees everything, whether it's people, plants, animals, landscapes, seasons, health, diet, life course, all of these things, everything being interconnected. This is a really useful and interesting thing to look at, with everything then being conceptualized and structured around the four elements and the humors. What I like about this is that this model sees no real separation between sort of like nature or culture. And in fact, within this stuff, there's not so much of a separation between arts and sciences either. So, I mean, if you think about Aristotle, he was both dealing with philosophy, but also a scientist as well. And this kind of takes a similar account of that because it's one of the big challenges that we have within archaeology at the moment is all of this separation, especially between sciences and arts. So again, what Richard was saying is that all of these things that we're looking at, uh, particularly within the uh, archaeological record, were in the past visualised as being made up of uh, elements and humours. So again, that's kind of fun that they've all got them. And it also, and this is kind of coming back to the environmental archaeology session yesterday, is that if all of these things are seen as being made up of these elements and humours, it really puts plants and animals... Um, in their life as well, as opposed to them just being dead products, kind of central to our archaeological reconstruction. So that's really, really cool. And when th these animals and plants are made up of all of these humours, um, it means that they also have the potential to transform and change human behaviour. And I'll give you some examples of this here. Because with all of these animals having their own temperament, so the different humours make up the temperament, um, what we need to realise is that within the medieval mind, certainly, all of these things, um, the, the temperaments of the animals and plants could be transferred to people through all of the senses. So the senses become important here as well. Whether this is through sight, sound, touch, taste, smell, they could all be incorporated into a person and therefore change the character of that person as well. So within the medieval mind, if you uh, touch something, it touches you back and there's a transfer. So there's some sort of permeability. And what this is showing here is this is a really nice illumination that shows this lady listening to the sound of the nightingale. And then you see the devil popping up because it was believed that the sound of the nightingale um, induced lust. And therefore, that's why we see the, the devil arriving. But there are many other examples. So um, I was alerted by Chris Walgart, who's written a book on medieval senses, to a particular example where people witness um, pigs copulating and then they're already bodily polluted so they have to go away and confess it uh, because they have been polluted by just seeing it it's already entered their body right um, and with that in mind with the sort of animal shagging element in mind I'm going to talk about um, these chickens because I think we tend to think all the time when we're looking at the archaeological record you know sometimes archaeologists zoo archaeologists spend a lot of time going is it male or is it female so that we can reconstruct the economic patterns that we see you know were they milking or all of these sorts of things but actually the sex and age of animals matters and particularly this is something I learned um, through keeping chickens is that cockerels are horrible they are rapey aggressive disgusting and here's an example of it here so it really does matter you know if you can consume the personality uh, of the animal just by seeing it or hearing it or having it around you are you necessarily going to want to have lots of cockerels around you you might not because it depends again on which section of society you are and this is something i'm going to talk about in a minute but first of all i want to explain just a bit of information about how we go about then determining 
the sex of chickens in the archaeological record. Traditionally, it's been based on this, the presence or absence of one of these spurs, the cock spur they're called, right? So if you've got one of these, we go, right, that's a boy, definitely a boy, sorted. Everything without them is a girl. But what our research has shown is that actually it takes a long time for one of these spurs to appear and be presented um, uh, on, on the bone itself. So these guys here are six to 13 months. We see no evidence of the spur, right? So a zoo archaeologist would potentially label this as a female chicken, and therefore we wouldn't kind of necessarily understand the sex structure. But what I need to tell you is that Gunther, our horrible rapey cockerel, right, he was nasty, nasty, nasty by five or six months of age. That's when they become fertile. Therefore, you do not need to have cockerels this age, 19 months, in order to sustain a flock okay you can have a, a five to six month old when it gets like really really nasty you can kill it and get a new one and it's all good so what i'm saying is if we find lots and lots of these spurs it suggests that there are lots and lots of really old cockerels okay now this is important and uh, i'm gonna come on to it because there is no reason no economic reason to keep lots and lots of these old cockerels so this then becomes potentially quite important when we're trying to characterize late Anglo-Saxon sites. Do we have any late Anglo-Saxonists in the audience? Okay, we've got one. Ben, how easy is it to determine whether or not we have a high status secular site or a high status ecclesiastical site? It's very difficult, right? Because they've all got the same material culture. Um, they're all essentially high status. So how do we go about characterizing these? are two sites where there's been a certain amount of debate about whether this is high status, ecclesiastical, or secular. So we've got uh, late Anglo-Saxon Flixborough, lots of debate about that one, and then Lemminge, which is being excavated, uh, I think, just in Postex at the moment, an AHRC project. Are these sites high status secular or high status ecclesiastical. They both got shed loads of chickens, I can tell you that. And um, this is then the age profiles that we get. <laughs> when we're looking at Flixborough, we find that there are, are many, many old males. All these blue ones here are the ones that have fully developed spurs. At Liminge, we've hardly got any of those guys, and in fact, we've got shed loads of females. So what is this telling us? Is that these two sites potentially, it, we could just interpret this in economic terms. But I think there's more to it. If we go back to this idea that the character of the animals matters, I do not think for one moment that monks, the most virtuous, non-sexual, predatory people, uh, no, where am I going with that? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay, in, in theory, the least uh, predatory people, uh, aggressive people on the planet would be surrounding themselves deliberately with aggressive, horrible old cockerels. I think that we would be looking at a different situation like this with lots and lots of hens keeping the number of cockerels to a minimum. Um, so what I would argue is that perhaps the chickens may be the key to characterising these sites based on what these creatures were like in life. So here, I think we're looking at flips where we've got evidence of cockfighting. Now, this is universally around the world. Wherever we have cockfighting cultures, this is more about military. It's about masculinity. It is not the kind of thing that monks are going to want to surround themselves with. Whereas at Liminge, I think that we are really looking at a place where they are keeping chickens, they're non-aggressive. Also, we've got the egg production to make pigments for for manuscript illuminations and things such as that. So that's one example. Oh, why did I put this in? Oh, you are what you eat. I suppose that's a classic as well. I think I'm just using this as a really bland segue into the next section, so just run with me on this. Okay, so here we were talking about chickens, and I was just thinking that maybe we need perhaps to even bring this concept of elemental theory that you are what you eat up to the present day, because this is the last 50 years of what's happened to chickens, that they've got big and fat, and everybody goes, oh, that's brilliant, we can get really big, fat chickens. But look what's happened to people. They've done exactly the same thing, and I kind of love that. So we need to be aware of what we're eating because it kind of transfers through the food chain to us as well in many ways. As I said, this was just a trite segue into the uh, next section, which is about then isotope analysis, which is based on the principle that you are what you eat. And I kind of like this within the idea of elemental philosophy because really it represents elemental philosophy for the 21st century because what you do in isotope analysis is try to chart quite literally how the elements transfer 
from the landscape through the food chain into the human body and become represented. So with this in mind, I'm going to use this as an example of how we could perhaps even use modern day scientific techniques like stable isotope analysis to kind of get a different perspective on the past. And there's one really lovely example that I just want to present, which was published in a fairly obscure journal in 2011. Um, looking at a number of Roman cemeteries in Oxfordshire. I love this example. I read it because I was just trying to find evidence of their fish consumption and stuff like that. And this is what they found. These are their results. They find that what this is showing here is the age of the individuals along the bottom. And we're using two different kinds of isotopes that they're demonstrating here. This is carbon, which gives us some indication of uh, how much fish is in the diet. And this is sulfur, which is a much better indication, particularly for uh, freshwater fish. Is that right, Holly? Good. Okay, she's the isotope person. It distinguishes between fresh and seed and drinks better for seed. Better for, okay, okay, but essentially the fishy thing works. Okay, good. Um, so what this is showing is that the younger individuals here, between sort of zero and five, their diet is looking as though it's quite heavily fish-based. But as they get older, that changes. We see a shift away from fish into these more terrestrial resources. Now, this then maps back to some of the stuff that Richard was saying about how your elements and your makeup changes through the life course. You start as a, a newborn baby coming from the watery environment of the womb. You're all wet and squishy and cold. And therefore, it's appropriate that you eat foods that are wet and squishy and cold, which is fish. And then the older you get, the more terrestrial and drier and hotter you become. And so we're perhaps seeing the diet changing along those lines and what's interesting is that the timing that we're seeing here corresponds to the timing that we see in a lot of the, the literature about when we would expect to see that shift happening so that's quite a nice example where in fact the guys who were doing this the uh, Nelix team they said oh that's interesting isn't it that that happens don't know why, and moved on. And that's, I think, a nice example of how, as archaeologists, we're not engaging with any of this stuff, whereas our interpretations could perhaps be informed if we looked at what people of the time were thinking. So this is, you are what you eat. This is a nice um, example of how all the different food stuffs as well, and I've just put a few onto this graph, I think I say I, Richard did it. Um, so all of these different food stuffs, plants and animals all had their own humoral makeup. So here we are, here's the, the fish, which is seen as cold and wet, and then dill and mustard. So all of these spices are hot and dry. So again, we should be looking for what different things people are eating, and that might tell us about what were the appropriate diets. And we need to remember, we've talked about medicine as well, that all of this then feeds back into ideas of human health as well. So this is a nice um, chart. Do I do anything with it? Yes, I do. Because I think this has then some applications for when we're, again, with archaeological science. We're working with a lot of guys who are doing um, pottery analysis, lipids and um, isotopes on pottery. This is a, a graph taken from Richard Evershed's work. We work with um, Oliver Craig and his lab at York. And they have huge problems because what they're trying to do is separate out, you know, what's cow's milk, what's sheep's milk. They're at the moment trying to find where chickens plot on the graph, right? And they plot somewhere in here with the goose and, and horse adipose fat. And, and they find this a huge problem because they're trying to identify to particular animals. But, right, if we then go back to this, we find that quite a lot of these different areas actually correspond to warm, dry or wet, warm. So we could perhaps step away from trying to identify all of these different things so long as we can work out roughly where these adipose things are plotting you know are they the warm wet and then just rethink the way that some of these results kind of work in the archaeological record if we find that everything in one pot is plotting up here or up here you know pigs and fish uh, are, are seen as cold and wet so it doesn't matter whether we are finding pigs or fish, what we can say is we're, this pot was used to cook stuff that was cold and wet. So that's kind of a different way of reconstructing <coughs> cuisines if we just take on this kind of elemental humoral principles um, in it. So let's move towards the conclusions. Have I gone really fast as well? Okay. Um, so whilst we're suggesting that, you know, this is... <laughs> we should be looking at, at some of these uh, ancient uh, pre-Renaissance ideas. Um, I'm not suggesting that we're ever kind of really going to have true empathy with these people, but I'm saying that maybe it's a better start 
for us to begin with some of the ideas and philosophies of the people, particularly in the medieval and Roman period, who are telling us what they think. And we're going, oh, actually, what we think is something about entanglement and materiality. Whereas, you know, everything that they're telling us is all of these things, as Richard said, that that elemental wheel is entanglement, it is materiality, it is all of these things bound up in one that then, if we can understand it, tells us about the identity of these particular individuals. So it's a, it's a really kind of nice way of starting, I think. Um, engaging with this, I think also then just like stretches our mind just a little bit, again, rather than having to run off to Madagascar to come up with some great theory that we can drop back onto the past, why not just kind of breed it up from where it came from and see um, what we can do with that. I like it also, as I've said, because I do think that it has the potential to be something of an aid to this kind of arts and humanities over here and sciences over here. This allows us to bring everything together and think about things in, in a different way and, and that's that's fun. Um, I have a lot of fights with old Craig um, about this because he's just like, you're such an idiot. No one would ever believe this. And then we chatted it through after like a huge shouting match and he's like, no, actually, I think that does work. So yay! Um, even the scientists are coming round. And um, what I love about it also is that it gives greater equality, I think, to all of the different strands of archaeological data. It doesn't privilege pots over pollen or animals over humans or any of these things. Everything is connected, and that is what I think makes it fun. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm for yes for an elemental return in archaeology. That is me out.